Hello, my name is Dr. Kimberly Cheatham, and welcome to this video presentation on normal labor and delivery. The objectives for this presentation are listed here. Labor is the physiologic process composed of uterine contractions and subsequent cervical change that leads to delivery of a fetus. Labor is traditionally assessed in terms of the three P's, the powers, the passenger, and the pelvis. The powers or uterine contractions must be strong enough to affect cervical change. The passenger, that is the fetus, must not be too large and must be positioned correctly in the pelvis. The passage or the birth canal must be of normal shape and size to allow the fetus to progress through to delivery. If labor is not progressing normally, consideration of the three P's can help determine the etiology of the abnormal labor pattern. The pregnant woman at term, which is defined as 37 weeks or beyond, who believes she is in labor should be evaluated in the triage area of an obstetric unit. Initial workup includes assessment of the maternal vital signs, fetal heart rate, and uterine contractions. If the patient and fetus are stable, proceed to reviewing the prenatal records and take a focused history, especially noting the gestational age of the fetus. You should inquire about the onset and timing of contractions, vaginal bleeding, leakage of fluid, and fetal movements. A focused physical examination should also be performed, including an abdominal examination with Leopold maneuvers, speculum exam, and cervical check for dilation. Labor is diagnosed when contractions lead to progressive cervical change. The clinician can determine positioning of the fetus during the physical examination with Leopold maneuvers and by palpating the topography of the fetus's head. Leopold maneuvers are specific methods of abdominal palpation that provide information to the clinician about fetal lie and presentation. If the cervix is dilated enough, fetal sutures and soft spots can be palpated that assist in determining the fetal position. This set of drawings illustrates some of the Leopold maneuvers. These drawings illustrate the presence of fetal sutures, which are anatomical lines on the fetal head where the bony plates of the fetal skull join together. Also present are the anterior and posterior fontanelles, which are the baby's soft spots on the skull. Palpation of the sutures and fontanelles during labor allows the clinician to determine the fetal position or which way the fetal head is facing in relation to the maternal pelvis. When describing the fetal position, the clinician references the occiput of the fetal head compared to the maternal pelvis. By palpating the posterior fontanelle, the occiput's location can be deduced. For example, if the fetal occiput is anterior toward the maternal pubic symphysis, which means the baby is face down, the position is described as occiput anterior or OA. If the fetal occiput is located toward the maternal sacrum and the baby is face up, the position is occiput posterior or OP. OA is the most common and most easily delivered fetal position. Other positions that are transverse or located 45 degrees from the anterior or posterior are also demonstrated on this illustration. Left and right orientations are also included in the various descriptions. Cervical dilation, effacement, and fetal station are evaluated by a digital vaginal examination. Remember that full cervical dilation is 10 centimeters in a term pregnancy. Effacement is the thinning of the cervix that ranges from a thickness of about 4 centimeters, which represents 0% effacement, to a paper-thin cervix that is considered to be 100% effaced. Fetal station is how high or low in the pelvis the leading edge of the fetal skull is. Station ranges from minus 5 centimeters to plus 5 centimeters. Zero station means the leading edge of the fetal skull is at the level of the ischial spines. A station of minus 1 means that the fetal skull is 1 cm above the ischial spines up in the pelvis. A station of plus 1 means that the fetal skull has progressed to 1 cm past the ischial spines toward the introitus. So a cervical examination that is reported as 4, 80, and minus 2 means that the cervix is dilated to 4 cm with 80% effacement and a minus 2 station. That is, the leading edge of the fetal skull is 2 centimeters above the ischial spines. 
The course of labor and delivery is divided into four stages, which are described here. Here are two illustrations of a pregnancy. On the left, below the fetal head, is the cervix. This cervix is closed and thick. Even if contractions are present, there's been no cervical change. This patient is not yet in labor. However, on the right, the cervix is dilated a little bit and is very much thinned out. This dilation and thinning represent cervical change, so this patient is in labor if regular contractions are present. The first stage of labor, defined as the period of cervical dilation to 10 centimeters, is divided into two phases, latent phase and active phase, which are described here. The graph on the right demonstrates a plotting of cervical dilation over time. During the latent phase, cervical change occurs slowly. During the active phase, cervical change occurs much faster. Management of the first stage of labor is described here. Pain medications are usually indicated during the first stage of labor. Options for pain control and labor are listed here. These illustrations represent the continuation of labor. On the left, the cervix is dilated significantly and the fetal head would be easily palpated on vaginal examination. On the right, the cervix is dilated completely and descent of the fetal head through the pelvis continues. Once the cervix has completely dilated, the patient has entered the second stage. This is the time in labor when the patient pushes and fetal descent through the pelvis occurs, ultimately leading to delivery of the baby. To facilitate maneuvering through the pelvis, the fetal cranial bones can overlap and mold to the necessary shape for successful descent. Swelling of the skin and subcutaneous tissues on the fetal head can also occur during the second stage. This swelling is called caput succedaneum. We just say caput. Here are some illustrations and a photograph demonstrating fetal molding of the head. Molding resolves one to two days after delivery. This photograph of the infant's head emerging through the vaginal introitus looks very pointy due to both molding and caput. You can see the imprint of this person's finger and the edema on this newborn's head. This edema is caput. Molding is also present with elongation of the head. A description of a normal vaginal delivery is provided here. These illustrations show the fetal head emerging through the vaginal introitus during birth. Notice the external rotation that occurs once the head is delivered. The term crowning describes the point when the widest part of the fetal head has reached the vaginal introitus. At this point, you should be ready for delivery. Once the head is delivered, the rest of the body soon follows. During the process of labor, the fetus proceeds through a series of predictable sequential maneuvers that result in delivery. These maneuvers are referred to as the cardinal movements of labor and include engagement of the fetal head in the maternal pelvis, descent, which occurs during all cardinal movements, flexion of the head on the fetal chest, internal rotation, usually to the occiput anterior position, extension of the fetal head around the pubic symphysis during crowning, external rotation of the fetal head after it comes through the introitus to realign the head with the fetal spine, and expulsion of the fetus's body. Delivery of the infant marks the beginning of the third stage of labor when the placenta will deliver. The clinician should exercise patients while waiting for the three signs of placental separation. When these signs are observed, 
Mild traction on the umbilical cord should lead to the emergence of the placenta at the vaginal introitus, followed by complete delivery. Counterpressure placed by the clinician's hand above the pubic symphysis will help maintain the uterus's location in the pelvis during traction on the umbilical cord. After the placenta is delivered, the clinician should examine it carefully for completeness and the presence of any abnormalities. Attention is quickly returned to the patient to evaluate the amount of vaginal bleeding and to determine if any perineal, vaginal, or cervical lacerations have occurred during delivery. Lacerations on the perineum are categorized into different degrees based on how deeply they extend toward the rectum. The two illustrations on the left demonstrate the normal vulvar anatomy and underlying musculature of the pelvic floor. The four illustrations on the right represent the four different degrees of perineal lacerations that can disrupt the vulvar structures and pelvic floor muscles when they occur. Lacerations are repaired by the clinician immediately after delivery. Once the placenta has delivered, which normally occurs within 30 minutes of the infant's delivery, the patient enters the fourth stage of labor. This two-hour period marks the most likely time that a patient with cardiac disease will decompensate because cardiac output is highest and fluid shifts are occurring from blood loss, intravenous fluids, and other causes. The nurse will observe the patient closely, checking vital signs every 15 minutes and palpating the uterus abdominally for appropriate firmness. Once the patient demonstrates hemodynamic stability after one to two hours, she is transferred to the postpartum area for the remainder of her hospital stay. This concludes this video presentation on normal labor and delivery.